So Chris, uh, I've been asked by somebody to quiz you on your knowledge of explorers. Basically, I want to we want challenges. Wanna, yes, challenges. Yeah. Let's see if I can remember enough of my own stuff to ask intelligent questions. <clears throat> and I will do my best to answer them correctly. Okay. <laughs> And that was kind of an odd answer. <clears throat> so we'll just strike that from the record. Chris. Okay. In the second gen explorers, what was the big change over year for uh, the body style? For the body style, that would be in 1998 would be the biggest body changeover. But wasn't there something unique about 98s that weren't available 97 and 99? Well, in 98, you still got your metal front bumper. Mm -hmm. and you got the round tailgate. So that was the main thing that was different. But the one thing that you could also see a little bit difference is like when 98 Limiteds were out, you mm. still had their plastic bumper from the 95 to 98 Limiteds, but the round tailgate was the dead giveaway for the 98 Explorers. See, he just wraps his hand around this. It's just so exciting for him. Um, <clears throat> Rather, most of us, this is trivial knowledge. But anyway, so, and now this is a toughie, and this is one that everybody wants to know. Are four liter socks reliable? In my opinion, yes. Why? <laughs> because people don't maintain them. That's the reason why they fail. That could be said of any engine. Why is Exactly. Socks? The sock is actually a very reliable engine. It is still made after the original Cologne 4 liter V6 that was in the overhead valve, but they just added timing chains to it in different heads. Um, this motor is very reliable and inherent of itself. Um, if you maintain it properly, it will last. The timing chains are not hard to replace and that's what a lot of people get scared about these motors or oh there's some sort of magical timing components no they're not hard well doesn't it doesn't replacing at least the rear set require you to pull the engine that's usually out of most people's pull the engine or the transmission i've actually have done a rear cassette by pulling the transmission on a vehicle before Mind you, it's not very fun, but I would prefer it being on a engine stand so I can do the whole engine at once. Most people aren't as small as you, so getting into some of those passages may be a little harder. Well, there are special tools for that as well. So there's actually in the to attack it from the rear. To attack it from the rear, yes. So that way you can actually uh, get onto the cassette with that particular toolkit. Great. Okay. So, but there's just so much so much drama about the sock engine can single overhead cam we just call them socks because it's easier to say uh the single overhead cam engine that was from 97 up to 2010 i believe was the running length of the single overhead cam engine and also made some appearances in the ranger uh land rover and also in the uh mustang the mustang Oh, well, and of course the Mountaineer as well. Mountaineer, the Aviator never got one though. It only got the 4.6. No, the, the Aviator only got the 4 liter, 4.6 uh, uh, double orb cam. Yeah, the fun engine. A lot of people, well, at least a lot of people I've read on, I've seen on forums and on Facebook and Messenger and all that crap. They want to know what year did they get start getting reliable? What year do we not have to worry about exploding timing chains? Well, they actually updated the timing chain components in mid-year 2001 is when they actually started updating the timing guides and they had a little bit more beef to them. That was about it. Um, they were just very mildly updated. They're still reliable engines overall. Um, you had a little bit better gaskets and things like that. Um, also, they, you know, they just sealed up a little bit better. There was three powertrains available from 97 up, more or less. Um, you had the 5 liter V8 with a 4R70W, F-150 powertrain, always for the win. Uh, 4 liter single overhead cam, which you uh, put behind the first 5 speed uh, transmission ever put in a US vehicle, the 5R55E. And then of course you had the 4 liter as well. A 4 liter was kind of unusual because you could get it with the M50D manual transmission. 
But out of all of those, let's just throw the manual transmission out of the window. We're still mostly with automatics. Which is the most reliable directory? Well, obviously the, the 99 to 01 5 liter V8 with the uh, 4R70W is a super reliable drivetrain. It's hard to beat it in any form or fashion. Um, even when the transmission has problems, those things still go like there's no tomorrow. So ranking from mm -hmm. ranking those particular engines and powertrain, the powertrain combos from one to three, reliability and power, which is the best? Well, with reliability and power, um, the five liter would be the top choice. Um, the it's kind of a toss between the sock and the overhead valve because they're so much alike. But one trade off was that you had a lot less power in the overhead valve and a lot more power in the sock engine. But you gave up a little bit of reliability in the sock because of poor maintenance from people. And then the other one, you could just, you know, dunk it in the ocean and pull it out and still drive it. Um, motor would drive with a bent connecting rod and be perfectly fine. Uh, considering that the engine that I currently have in my 93 came from a rollover that still ran. But, <clears throat> okay. So enough about engines for once. Uh, I wanted to just touch on that since it's a bit of a sore subject for a lot of people um, who own Explorers or Mountaineers or Rangers. And I wanted to go into the off-road capability. We've, we've got four generations of body-on-frame explorers, and negating the fifth, sixth, and what is it the seventh generations? Which well, it's a, I think it's the sixth gen. It's the sixth point. gen. The what sixth Ford gen. Considers I, it. I don't know when they split it exactly because they did like three body changes in the fifth gen or something like that. Three fascia changes or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, body-on-frame, pretty much where we're going to go with from here. Uh, Off-road capability. The, nine, the 91 through 94 had the TTB twin traction beam suspension on it. So um, you had a lot of articulation there. You had a lot of articulation for going yep. off-road. And then uh, I guess in order to make it a little bit nicer for mom, soccer moms, they switched to um, a double wishbone suspension for the mm -hmm. front, you know, a torsion bar style uh, in uh, 95 and all the way up to 2010. Mm -hmm. So I'll, there's a, a lot more second gens than there are first gens. Obviously, just yeah. because of, they made them for so much longer. Yeah. But um, we'll just focus on the first two generations because the third and fourth generation have their own set of unique um, challenges when it comes to off-roading, considering how the rear suspension was set up at that time. But first gen and second gen are fairly they're fairly the same. Um, it, the body the body changed. The frame really didn't change that much. The um, you still had a solid rear axle in the back. Mo most of the changes were powertrain related, interior, and uh, front suspension. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that was really the main difference. It was pretty much a, just a refined version of the first gen. It was. It definitely was. Um, the first gen uh, definitely has a little bit more off-road capabilities, uh, reliability with the electrical systems when um, Ford upgraded in 95 to uh, OB2, you got a lot better uh, electrical systems. So we're talking um, about 95. Yeah, Whoa. 95 is kind of a, the, the mid-year where it was trying to be ODB one and a half at that point. Um, so still a lot of weird stuff was happening around that time with Ford trying to get up changeover in their electrical systems, but their electrical systems were a lot more refined, uh, more reliable. Um, so also with the suspension changeover, it came a lot more reliable as well. Um, the, the golden rule of thumb is that if you really want to off-road, you can get that, the, the first gen, uh, TTB you can actually remove it and really easily do solid axle swaps on them. Uh, the second gen, they're not as easy to do that too. Um, you have a lot more um, suspension upgrades available for the first gen, but then you're also only limited to the four liter V6 overhead valve in the first gen. Well, not necessarily. I mean, well, from the factory. From the factory, that's what you're limited to. 
Uh, that's not what Bandit Customs does, so. No. <laughs> I mean, I have a 92 Explorer with a second gen frame and a five liter V8 and all wheel drive, so. The thing is with, uh, there were some really unique things about um, first gens. They're kind of, kind of owning a first gen is one of the most nerve wracking and probably challenging uh, vehicles to own if you're into Explorers at least from my perspective. Um, they have they have their own unique quirks. Every year has some major change that's different from the different from the next year. All the way from 91 through 94 and even 91 had like two to three different major changes through the whole through the whole year that are just crazy. Um, you mind just giving us a little background on why the first gens are such I don't know best word to say bastard. Well <laughs> From what we can tell, Ford was trying to uh, get these vehicles perfected as they were producing them. They were kind of rushed through to be put in production. Um, there was a lot of carryover from Bronco 2 into the 91. Like the floor pan is different in a 91 than a 92. So like you can't take carpet out of a 92 and put it into a 91 and the seat tracks don't bolt up. It's very weird stuff um but like for example even like 93 explorers that weren't california emissions didn't have egr where 94s did there's a lot of little intricate little things that they did that made the explorer just kind of a challenge to work on in a day-to-day -day process um but the one thing I've done is I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out all those little changes as they happen. <laughs> and, you know, even from like the uh, intermediate engine shock that they actually put in the early 91s, but not in the later 91s. Yeah, or the way that they changed the AC systems in the early 91s and the later 91s and then changed it again in 92 and then uh, once again in 93 because yeah, when they went to a 134A. Yeah, yeah. so the whole the whole first gen things, each one is almost like a custom build. It's 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 got some things that are all the same, but there's little little changes that are throughout that make them uh, definitely unique challenge. Yeah. So um and they made a whole bunch of different models that you never saw in any other year's Explorers, like the Eddie Bauer two-door edition and the limiteds that were only in select colors then didn't have very many options, but they were really, really plush and had these awesome like recliner-like seats that you never saw again in any Explorer. Yeah, they are, they are definitely unique. But let's touch on the other the other remaining generations, first and first and second, are generally the most uh, most well known. Second gen, are obviously, the most. But um, third gens and third gens, fourth gens, fifth gens, and oh god, the new sixth gens. But let's go in let's go in order. Third gens. What is what was that was a major change for the Explorer, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it was the it, independent rear suspension what? that made a huge difference they also with the independent rear suspension they allowed for the the third row seating but didn't wasn't it also a huge breakaway because the first generate the first gens and the second gens were based were were partially based on the ranger correct mm -hmm. and wasn't the third generation a complete breakaway from ranger based vehicles yes, it was its own vehicle at that point there's not there was no other vehicle on its platform um the Explorer was solely by itself. Even the Explorer Sport was still on the second gen platform, Ranger slash platform. And the third gen Explorer was its own beast completely. Yeah, so what were the, what were, other than the suspension changes, what were the other, what were the other things that, cause a lot of people meld the third and fourth gens together because they, they, they look, they, they look similar. They have, Pretty much the same frame, the same suspension, the same engines, give or take. Rel relatively, yeah. yeah. They're kind of the same design architecture, um, but you still had the independent rear suspension. Uh, you, you you got a lot of different things that changed. You know, the complete AC system was moved to a different spot in the firewall, so it allowed for them to put bigger engines in there. Like for example, the four six and. And in the aviator, they were able to put the 4.6 uh, 
uh, Double Rubber Cam V8 in there uh, and had plenty of room still. Um, they also went to, even on the V8 trucks, they still used a 5R type transmission. Uh, the transmissions themselves had a different uh, softer aluminum magnesium case, which ended up causing Ford some little headaches with the transmissions with the servo bores. But overall, they're still very reliable vehicles, especially if you fix those little quirks here and there. They're super reliable and, and fun to drive still. Um, super smooth on the road have plenty of get up and go um, and they can haul your whole family across the entire united states if you wanted it to those generations though they uh, they definitely i think the fortune definitely had a really good look to it, it was the last body on frame design that uh, ford ever did for the explorer but also at the same time when they moved to the larger frame in the third gen it wasn't exactly a mid-size suv anymore i mean it, it was bigger in every way to ford it was still their mid-size suv because this was still before the um the um crossover phase start hitting the market so it was still considered a mid-size suv for what it is now in today's standards it would probably be more of a full-size suv but um, Ford still produced the Expedition and the Lincoln Navigator, which was their full-size SUVs. And then there was also around that same time, they were also doing the Excursion, which was an ultra-sized SUV. So. Now, the fifth gen was very controversial when it popped around. Um, I believe for the large part because it turned everything, put everything in the front. It was front-wheel drive. And... Yeah. Um, Diehard Explorer fans were, there was a cacophony of just insults and, and, and just screaming and gnashing of teeth over Ford's rebellious design of yeah. turning it into a crossover. Um, admittedly, there, I, admittedly I, I myself did not really care for uh, a front-wheel drive uh, SUV, especially because an Explorer was just known for being this four-wheel drive op, uh, capable vehicle and even though they offered a four-wheel drive version it felt more like a tacked on all-wheel drive system well ford was following what the masses wanted not so much what enthusiasts wanted uh, the masses wanted a suv for hauling family not for off-road capability um, it was also used very heavily with the police departments, taxi cabs, things like that. Service industry was very, very happy with what the uh, Explorer and the police interceptor offered. Um, but it was still not what a lot of enthusiasts would have wanted. But what's nice is Ford is going back to a rear wheel drive platform. Even though it's still be unibody and not body on frame, it is still going back to a rear wheel drive platform. I often wonder what prompted Ford to go back that route. I mean, it really didn't add much as far as towing capacity, and now you got a huge ash drive shaft going on. More that. pressure from um, uh, law enforcement. They actually really wanted the rear wheel drive platform. Uh, that makes sense. Okay, so we're, we're, we're going through the lineage of the Ford Explorer, which is uh, going to come up on, let's see, 20, 2021 is going to be, what, 30 years? Yep, it's going to be the 30th anniversary of the Explorer coming up. Yep. 30, 30 years of Explorers and millions of them, millions of them made. One of the most popular SUVs, midsize SUVs ever made by Ford or ever made by any any company at this point. Drastically changed my life. The um, Sport Track. Mm -hmm. The Sport Track was kind of a Ranger on steroids, wasn't it? A little bit, yes. It, they, they wanted to pull from the Explorer uh, popularity. Uh, instead of actually pulling from the Ranger side, they pulled from the Explorer side and made basically a crew cab Ranger-esque Explorer. Uh, sold very, very well. Uh, still to this day, people are really, really scam uh, trying to find these things and buy them. Uh, people love them. You can even do like, uh, I've done multiple five liter swaps on these these trucks because they only came with the four liter and the earlier sport tracks. Not until uh, they did the body, the, the changeover to the third gen platform, 
that they actually get a, um, a four six. You said uh, Explorers changed your life. Wow, that sounds like a really dramatic statement. It's just a vehicle. Why? Why do you say that? Well, when you're a very young, I think I was probably like 14 years old when I first saw my very first Explorer. Um, it meant a lot to me because my parents were actually car shopping for an SUV uh, and they were looking at the Jeep Cherokee and and a few others vehicles at the time that were kind of like an SUV but not quite station wagons and things like that Ooh. and then the Explorer came out in spring of 1990 and that's when I saw my first Explorer my parents saw their first Explorer and we, everybody in my family just fell in love with this vehicle. Um, and within a month, they had special order their, their 91 Explorer. And we, my family owned an Explorer since June of 1990. So Explorers have been in my life since that time. Um, in my family, we have never not owned an Explorer since that, since they've come out. So we're talking about almost 30 years of are my family owning explorers. The, in my opinion, it's a way of life. It's, it's, it's the excitement that it brings. It, it gives you that feeling of being on the open road and going anywhere you want to go. Like you can buy any kind of car in the world and go on a road trip with it, but who says you can't go on a road trip and then go to the top of the mountain with it? <laughs> That's what an explorer can do for you. It, takes you places that nowhere, no, nothing else can do that. So it's, it's basically, uh, it's basically a way of freedom. It's, it's, it's yeah. an image, it's, it's an icon of freedom for you. Yes, it is. So it's freedom that. and, um, happiness. I got my first Explorer based vehicle, which was a 1992 Mazda Navajo, um, back in October of 1997. And that was damn near the happiest day of my life I was getting my my vehicle it was my own vehicle it was my first vehicle that I ever owned uh, and it's taken me everywhere and to this day I still own it yeah you you did something special with your Navajo didn't you I, I did I did a lot of special stuff with my Navajo uh, it was the very first uh, first gen to ever get four-wheel drive converted um, even on the 20th anniversary of my ownership, I went out and I decided to get its VIN number tattooed across my heart. <laughs> wow, uh, that is some dedication there. It is, it's highly dedication. And it's not just a vehicle, it's a passion and a love.